Colossians tonight. Colossians chapter 3. I won't be long tonight. I enjoyed hearing all those specials. Those are always a blessing. And it's always a lot of fun hearing everybody uh, just sing all their songs, play the instruments. And it's good. Uh, I, I believe music is a great thing. And we see, we're going to see here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Notice what it says. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Music does a lot for us. Singing, it does a lot for us. And one of the things that we see that it does here is that it, you know, it teaches and admonishes us. There's a lot of things that we know. There's a lot of scriptures that we often know because we hear them in songs. There's often a lot of doctrine that we know because we sing them in songs. And we've sang it so many times, we've sung it over and over again, that it is. I mean, it's just people have got it because they know the songs. It helps teach us. But we got to be careful because sometimes songs have uh, false doctrine in them. And we've pointed some of those out, you know, even in our own hymn book, uh, you know, put out by a Baptist publishing company, there's some songs in there that aren't exactly biblical. And we got to watch out for that because I've had people before when you're having a doctrinal discussion, resort to not quoting the scripture, but quoting lines from songs. And I've done that before. I mean, I've got up and I've said something like it was a fact from behind the pulpit and it was just a line from a song and it wasn't even biblical. And that's embarrassing when that happens. But we've, we've all done it before and we've, we've said those things. But we see here in this passage, you know, it tells us we're supposed to be teaching and admonishing one another. And that term, uh, word admonish, it's not one we use that often, but it means, you know, to teach uh, or to warn, to warn or notify a fault or to reprove with mildness. So whenever the Bible says we're supposed to use psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, not just to teach, but also to correct teaching. And, you know, when I was reading that, I kind of started getting this mental picture in my head. You know, I've always liked musicals and stuff. You know, whenever you're having a discussion, instead of just rebuking somebody, you know, maybe breaking out into song, what, maybe that would go over a little better. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I've had some doctrinal discussions get pretty ugly. Maybe if I'd have just broke out into song, it wouldn't have been so ugly. But I don't know. It's, it's never like in the movies where when you start singing, all of a sudden you have an orchestra backing you up. That's never happened before. And, you know, and all the people start singing with you. That would be pretty cool if it did, though. But that's just not the way it works. But it is. It's, it's a way to correct, um, you know, to counsel against wrong practices, to caution or advise or to instruct or direct. And so we do, you know, we see kind of with the definition, you know, it's one of the ways that we correct people. And I think it's very important that, you know, we make sure that our music is biblical. We need to make sure it's, it, it's biblically sound, that it lines up with the Bible because we're teaching people things. And if we're singing things that have wrong doctrine in them, I mean, it's real easy for us to start accepting that false doctrine. And, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, even songs like, you know, Victory in Jesus, it's amazing how many people, uh, you know, I never noticed for years, sang that song all my life, and I never noticed how it says, you know, talks about repenting of your sins and winning the victory that way. And it's like, you know, that's not biblical. But at the same time, people can say that, you know, it's in gospel tracts all over the place that that's what you have to do. And people don't even bat an eye. You know why? Because they've been singing that line their whole life. You know, the old account was settled. It uses, it, it says the same thing in there. And, you know, we got to watch out for stuff like that. And, you know, when you do, when you start singing songs differently than they're written, you know, people act like you're changing the Bible. And uh, it's, it's not the same thing. Changing the words of a hymn is not the same as changing the words of the Bible. Okay, Our hymns are not inspired of God. But it is. It's important. we got to make sure that we get it right. And so to admonish, you know, it's, it's to reprove with mildness. Okay, It is. It's kind of, it's kind of a, an easy, softer way to correct somebody. Uh, you know, One way, uh, something I, I did years ago, I remember um, one of our family members was going to marry... Uh, a Calvinist or got started seeing a Calvinist and you know of course we weren't happy about it and so um, they were visiting with us at our church and I was leading the singing and so guess what songs I picked out I picked out songs like whosoever will and uh, you know I picked out all songs that just kind of went against Calvinism I wasn't preaching so I couldn't preach against Calvinism but I thought you know I'll get her I'll I'll reprove her with songs <laughs> and, uh, and it was funny she she was out there in the audience and kind of laughing about it you know she she got the message uh, of course 
she still married the guy. But anyway, uh, that that didn't help. But anyway, you know that. But it is we can often you know use that. And you know I don't think it's necessarily wrong to use a line of a song to maybe correct somebody as long as it's biblical. That's fine. You know, it, to show people that hey, you know this. You've been singing this your whole life. When we're trying to show that Revelation six. Or you know, or the or the, rap, or the rapture comes in Revelation seven, right after the sixth seal in Revelation, where the clouds are rolled back like a scroll. You know, I've quoted. You know, you know this. You've sang about it all your life, and it is well with my soul. You know, and just you kind of point those things out, and it's it's a it's an easy way to reprove people. But when we you know we do we hope to get people straightened out through singing, but if not, then we go to the preaching, and maybe that's why we usually start out with the singing. All right, you know, let's. Let's sing some doctrine to people. And then if that doesn't register, if that doesn't go through, then after the singing, we have the preaching time. And then that's where we get to a little more straightforward, maybe a little bit of yelling and shouting and things like that. I'm all for that. But when we understand that music and singing is supposed to be used in church to teach and to admonish, then we've got to make sure our music is biblical. Titus 2.1, it says, But speak thou things which become sound doctrine. We don't want to be sending mixed messages in our church. We don't want to be confusing people with what we preach. We don't want to be singing about one thing and then preaching about something different that conflicts. It's going to throw people. It's going to confuse people. It's going to get them all messed up. And I believe it's important that our doctrine is clear in our music. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 7, And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they have a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? For the, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise, he except ye utter by tongue, by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Okay, and it's talking about that when it talks about the trumpet giving an uncertain sound. You all know how you know, back in the day they would blow a trumpet, and that would give different signals for what the army was supposed to do. And if it's given an uncertain sound, people aren't going to know what to do. And I think it's the same thing when it comes to our music, when it comes to our preaching. We don't want to be sending a conflicting message. We don't want to be confusing people. It's important that we do that our doctrine is sound. It's clear. I think it's important in church that we're straightforward about what we believe. Have you ever been to a church before and you can't figure out what these people really believe? You know, you want to know what this preacher's thinking, where he's coming from, but you can't figure it out. It's like they're talking in code. You know, just tell us what you think. It's, and it's especially, they're especially bad when it comes to, you know, controversial subjects. You know, they just kind of just, you know, beat around the bush. They dance around the issues. And you know, why don't you just save us a bunch of time and just tell us what you think? You know, just better yet, tell us exactly what the Bible says. You know, show us from the Word of God. And many times you just can't tell from people. And there's a lot of songs out there. There's been songs that, you know, we've heard, that we've enjoyed, you know, because, you know, it's just good music, I guess you could say. And then we've been practicing the song. And it's like, we're trying to figure out if that has, if it's biblical or not. You know, and a lot of songs that have come out recently that are like big hits in Baptist churches have a very dispensational salvation slant to them. And when we've heard these songs, we've often gotten confused and wondered, you know, you know, is this even right? It's real confusing. The doctrine in those songs is not clear at all. And so you know what we do? We just, we're not going to sing them. I don't want to confuse people with that song. I don't want to confuse them on the message of salvation. So, you know, we're going to sing songs that have clear doctrine and not because we don't want to send an uncertain sound. And so, you know, while the words in our songs don't necessarily have to all be verses from the King James Bible, I believe the doctrine should line up with the King James Bible. And there are some people that have put psalms to music. Uh, some, you know, from the, you know, actual psalms, word for word. And some of them are beautiful. Some of them are like, you kind of had to force it in there. You know, it's like maybe in Hebrew that rhymed, you know, but in English it's not rhyming. You know? And it just, sometimes it's hard to make it sound good. But some of them are, they're beautiful. And I think it's great when people can do that, when they can put the actual words of the Bible word for word to music. But I don't think we have to do that. But I do think our music should line up with the doctrine of the Bible. I think that's very important. we got to make sure we do that. And I believe also, so we need to make sure our music's biblical, and it needs to be spiritual. Okay? And look what it says 
um, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says close to the same thing that we read in Colossians 3, 16, but it says, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Okay? So uh, spiritual songs, things that appeal to the spirit and how, what, how do we know what appeals to the spirit? Well, I can give you one hint. If it appeals to the flesh, it doesn't appeal to the spirit. And most music that's in churches today, it is geared towards the flesh. And that's why we have, you know, the Christian rock, all this contemporary junk, this, you know, feel good stuff that just goes right along with the world's music. Listen, our world, it is, it is carnal. There is nothing spiritual about our world. There is nothing spiritual about the music that's being put out by all the lost people in the world. And when Christians take the world's music and they put spiritual words to them, it doesn't make it a spiritual song because that the music itself is carnal. The music itself appeals to the flesh. And what blows my mind about this, and I've, I've preached about this before, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but the only people in the world who will disagree with music being amoral are liberal Christians, liberal, carnal, worldly Christians. Lost people understand that music appeals to the flesh. They get it. They get it that certain music makes you want to dance a certain way. They get it that certain music is sensual. They get it. But supposed Christians, they can't get it. Whenever you talk about, you know, you rebuke them for using sensual, worldly, and even devilish music in their churches. No, nah, music is amoral. You're an idiot if you think that. Only supposed Christians believe that. I have talked to uh, rock, you know, guys who are in rock bands that will agree with me 100% on this stuff. I used to work with a guy that was in a rock band and I said something negative about rock music one time and he immediately turned it around on me and saw, said how Christian rock music is the same thing. And then he didn't know what to think when I agreed with him. And I said, yeah, and it's garbage. And there's nothing Christian about it. They never know how to respond to that. Just recently, a lady I work with, she said the same thing. So this, and you know, completely she did. She, I criticized the music that was playing and she totally turned it around on me. It's the same thing as the Christian rock music. It's the same kind of music, just different words. And I said, I know it. And that's ridiculous. And that's, the, you know, that's just wrong. And there's nothing Christian about that kind of music. Even lost people understand that. Lost people get it. But so-called Christians in these rock and roll churches, they're the only ones dumb enough to say something like that. Very musicians who write these, this music will agree with me that it is sensual, that it appeals to the flesh, and that is not spiritual at all. And we're, our songs, our music should be spiritual. And one of the ways that we know that it's spiritual is the fact that the world can't stand it. And a lot of these trendy churches too, that's why they're going to all this junk. They're going to the contemporary stuff because we got to figure out how to reach the community. Well, the community is lost. The community is not going to like spiritual music. They want carnal stuff. They want worldly stuff. That's what appeals to them. But the Bible told us we're supposed to be using spiritual songs. So you know what? They are not going to register with lost people. They're not going to like it. They're not going to enjoy it. And you know, some, if a lost person enjoys our music in this church, there are some lost people that will enjoy hymns for one reason and for one reason only, and it's because they have memories of going to church with their grandma when they were a little kid, and it's the same songs they sang with her, and it takes them back to the time with their grandma. You know, And so they'll like it for that reason. So if a lost person ever tells you, yeah, I like the hymns, that's why they like the hymns, all right? It's not because they're really saved, okay? It's just because it gives them good memories of their grandma. But understand that there is, there is a huge difference between carnal music and spiritual music, and our music should be spiritual. Galatians 5.16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another. So you cannot do the things that you would. Our music is always going to clash with the world's music. It's not going to go together. The world will never like our music, and we should never like their music. You say, but I do like their music. Yes, your flesh does. 
But the Spirit of God that is in you does not like it and doesn't want to have any part of it. And so you need to, under, you need to understand we need to stay away from that stuff and we need to keep it out of church. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 15 through 21, if you read that when you get a chance, it talks about, you know, in that passage, it talks about, you know, eating all that your soul lusteth after. Not all lust of the flesh is bad, okay? If you see a juicy T-bone steak smothered in onions and, you know, drenched in A1 sauce, you're going to lust after that. And I don't believe that's a sin. To, to lust after that, you know, if you lust after your wife, there's no sin in lusting after that. There are some things that's okay if they appeal to your flesh. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. And you know, I do believe that there is some music that maybe appeals to the flesh that isn't bad, but isn't something that we ought to have in church. Okay, you know, and I've been, I remember I ran in one of the five Ks in town, and you know, right before they started, when we started running, they started playing the Eye of the Tiger. I don't know, that song gets me fired up when I, you know, if I'm running. I don't think that's necessarily a sin if you enjoy that, all right? You know, there's some music that it is. It's fun, you know, it, it might, you know, there, there's marching music. You know, there's some things that they do. They appeal to the flesh, but not in a bad way. But should we have the eye of the tiger in church? You know, I mean, should we put Christian words to that song? Absolutely not, Okay. While that might not be bad, I don't know all the words of that song, so there might be some bad things in there, and you know, don't say by the time he endorses that song, right? I'm just saying that my flesh likes it, and I don't necessarily think it's a sin, okay? But I do believe it would be wrong to have that in church because there's nothing spiritual about it. That's all about the flesh. And so there are, there's some things that you know people like them that aren't necessarily sinful, but I don't believe we ought to bring it into church. And so there are, there's, there's lots of songs out there that are, there's nothing spiritual about them, but I enjoy them. I don't, I don't think they're sinful, you know, stars and stripes forever. All right. You know, we all like that song when we hear that one, are we going to have that in church? Are we going to figure out how to put words to that and sing it in church? No, we're not. But is it a sin if you go home and you listen to that tonight? If your kid's playing in a marching band and they play that song, that's not a sin. But it's not for church. We're not going to teach and admonish people with songs like that. So there is, there is, I do believe there's music that is okay for you to be a part of that's outside of church. That's not, you know, that's not sinful, but we don't need to bring that in church. And so, you know, not everything that your flesh desires is sinful. And there are, there, there's some things that our flesh does desire though that are sinful. And there is music that appeals to that. And once again, everybody knows that except for liberal carnal Christians. They're the only ones that don't get it. And so then finally, just last real quick, the last thing we need to make sure about our music is that our music is about praising the Lord, not praising the singer, praising the musician. Now listen, there is nothing wrong. I, I believe, and we're not going to go to all the scriptures. If you go back in the Bible and it talks about the Levites, it talks about how they were skilled musicians. They were good at what they did. I believe they were good at their singing. I believe they were good at their instruments. I believe it's, it is appropriate. If, if you are going to play a song in church or sing a song, you ought to strive to do your best. You ought to want to be good at what you do. The Bible says in Colossians 3 23, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Well, if we're doing it for the Lord, what don't we want to do a good job? Don't we want to be good at what we're doing? But at the same time, while we're trying to do it good and be the best that we can at it, we need to understand that, hey, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm doing this. This is an opportunity for me to use my talents to praise the Lord, to um, admonish everyone, to encourage them. And I want, I want to do a good job. But you know what? Sometimes a lot of people, they get freaked out about specials in church and things like that, you know, because it does turn into you know, a big production sometimes. You have those people that just love themselves to death. There's one person in particular that I'm not related to. My wife's related to. She already knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and she sang at a funeral one time. At a funeral. And I mean, it is just like dancing and just getting into this song. And it was one of the most arrogant people you've ever met in your life. And she's singing a special in a funeral. And it's just, 
You know, she was doing everything to point at herself except for actually pointing at herself through the whole song. I mean, it was just, it was nauseating. Absolutely nauseating. It, that has no place in church. And we've seen those people before. We were at the National Sword of the Lord Conference one time, and we watched these two guys, two of the most pompous guys you ever saw in your life, get up and sing How Great Thou Art. And let me tell you, they were good. And they knew they were good. And they didn't try to hide the fact that they knew that they were good. And, I mean, it was one of those things you just had to see it. It was hilarious. I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm cracking up. She, my wife's getting angry at it. You know, she, it's just infuriating her at just how pompous and full of themselves these guys were. But it was, it, I'd have been full of myself if I could sing that good, probably. But once again, is that what we're supposed to be about? Is that why we're doing these things? Our music should be about praising the Lord. Psalms 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. And it just goes on. I, I'm not going to quote, I can't quote the whole thing, but if you read it, it's all about, you know, praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and heart. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with the stringed instruments organ. It says, praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. You know, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. But you know what? Some people are so arrogant, they have figured out how to take music and how to take words of praise to God, music that praises God, in a setting where we're supposed to praise God, and they can use all of those things and praise themselves. And we've all seen it before. We've all been there before, and we've got to watch out for that. We need to make sure that we don't ever let it ourselves get caught up in that, because when we are singing, we're supposed to be praising the Lord. And so, you know what, if I'm up here singing a special trying to praise the Lord, please explain to me how me dancing around is going to help with that. Okay. Now, I, understand, it's, I read, I said the quote of the verse that praise him with the timbrel and dance. Okay. And I preached a whole message about dancing one time. Should we have dancing in the church? And if you, if you weren't here for that, go back and listen to that message. I think I explained that very well. But once again, the dance that it talked about back then is not the way people are dancing in churches today. Right? The way people are dancing in churches today, these are moves they got off MTV and stuff like that, or you know, someplace you know, wicked. And we need to stay away from that. And, and how does you singing How Great Thou Art, talking about God, how does it make people think God's great when you're up busting a move during that song? It, it doesn't. It, you know, dancing... It draws, today's dancing, it all draws attention to the dancer and, and to the individual. And that is not what it is about. <clears throat> and so we need to, music is a great tool that God's given us. And we've got to be careful because the devil, he has counterfeits of everything that's good. He is a counterfeiter. He's got other Bibles. He's got other Gospels. He's got other religions. You know, all these things that are good, he's got a counterfeit out there. And music, one of the greatest things that there is, one of the I mean, just you know, beautiful things that God has given us, the devil has taken that and he's got counterfeits out there. And it is in churches, just like the false Bibles, the false Gospels, all, the false prophets. He's got it in churches all over the place. And it, his music's dangerous. How do we know when it's his? If it's his, it's going to appeal to your flesh. I promise, not all the devil's music that he's going to use is going to be the head-banging jungle junk that's, going, that's out there. Not all of it's like that. Okay, I, you know, I guess maybe, if it's, it's, it's probably, I think music's like drugs, all right? You know, you got to, you know, you don't just take the hardcore drugs right away. You know, you got to build up to it. And I can't imagine listening to that head-banging stuff, you know, turned up real loud that, you know, vibrates your car, you know, it vibrates other people's car. I, can, I don't get where there's any pleasure in that. But, you know, maybe if I started messing with that stuff, I'd figure it out. You know, I, but at the same time, that's not the only thing the devil has. It's not just the, you know, crazy meth head looking people, you know, biting the heads off bats and things like that. You know, it's, you know, there's, there's the more sensual stuff too. There's the, you know, the, the Taylor Swift, Katy Perry, Garth Brooks, is he still singing? I don't know. I mean, I, 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 whoever, the, whoever the big people are, Elvis Presley, you know, you know whoever they are, you know, there's the more mild stuff out there too, where it, it's, it's, his, it's definitely the devil's stuff. It's his music, and it appeals to the flesh, and it, it would be easiest to, for us to, it'd be easy for us to take the bait. 
and fall that garbage if we're not careful. And so the key is, especially in church, is we need to keep the focus on God. Keep the focus on spiritual. Make sure your music's biblical. Make sure it's spiritual. And make sure it is about praising Him. And like I said, there is music that's not necessarily spiritual that I don't believe is bad. But I do believe, because of the fact that we are we're already so stinking carnal, I do think it's important that the vast majority of the music that you listen to be spiritual music. Okay, We need all the help we can being spiritual. We've got enough carnal stuff in our life. And so I hope that was helped to you. So let's pray. Dear Lord.